Welcome to Our World Today, a progressive political show imagining a better tomorrow. I'm Suzanne Linton, and tonight we have News A Different Perspective with Jeff Nygaard. But sitting in Dave Bicking's seat, we have Nancy Doyle Brown. Welcome. Thank you. Welcome. Yeah, Dave Bicking is a little ailing, but he'll be back next month, I'm sure. So we're, if you're watching, Dave, get well soon. <laughs> uh, exactly. We'll rotate around the table because I'm, I'm going to be sitting in Suzanne's spot. Yes, yeah, so and next Dave month. And will be sitting here. And, right. Yeah, it'll just be, you'll be, you'll yeah. be the host. Yes. It'll be wacky and fun. <laughs> Zany. Yes, yes. Um, Contrary to tonight. <laughs> well, you know, tonight's it's a little... It'll be grim and serious. Not yes. only is it a different sort of lineup, which is a little unusual, but um, we also didn't do a show in November because activism mm -hmm. got in the way of campaigns and things like that. Mm -hmm. So, so um, th there's a danger of overload. When I was putting together my notes, just realizing that a some lot. things that have happened seems like forever ago, mm -hmm. uh, we haven't gotten to yet. And we just won't. That's the nature and of the, the news cycle. There's always uh, uh, more than we can cover. Mm -hmm. But the, the way we've been doing our world today the uh, news, a different perspective lately as we start out with some what we call headlines, just, just short little blurbs. So I've got a list of here of things. Um, one of them is very timely because as we uh, do the show on Monday, December 2nd, we're just a couple days after this kickoff of the Christmas shopping season. Wasn't the holiday that a shopping day. season. Black Friday they call it because that's the day, the day after Thanksgiving is the day supposedly that retailers go into the black. They make, the, they make their money for the year or they don't mm. or they, they get an idea if they're going to. So it's called Black Friday for that reason. Um, one of the notable things that wasn't um, um, covered very well in the corporate media was uh, the growing number of protests of various kinds uh, that occurred on Black Friday. Most of them, uh, I'm, or the ones I'm thinking about, uh, having to do with retail workers actually protesting the the way they're treated and the pay level for the work that after all the the retail clerks and the stockers and the bus boys and all that stuff are the ones that make Black Friday happen. Yes. Um, and uh, well, uh, especially Walmart. Walmart is the, 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 has been the target, but but targets wages are also targeted uh, targeted, <laughs> and no pun intended. And uh, yeah, they but were the all out. The protests were mostly Walmart. Aimed at Walmart and and the, the big box stores in general, mm -hmm. but Walmart was the focus. Um, Relevant to that was a, a, a report that came out um, just during the last month. I'm trying to remember exactly when. Oh, it came out on October 15th. Um, a report called Fast Food Poverty Wages from the mm, yes. UC Berkeley Labor Center. And Minnesotans for a Fair Economy also did some publicity uh, on this effects in Minnesota. And the report basically, um, well, I'll just read from the um, press release. A uh, new report by researchers at the University of California, Berkeley, showing that the fast food industry costs American taxpayers nearly $7 billion per year because their jobs pay so little. And why is that? Because the report found 52% of fast food workers are forced to enroll their families in public assistance programs because of low wages. Um, now, they're talking specifically about fast food mm -hmm. um, um, industry, but of course, the same applies to, to Walmart. The fast food wage um, average wage nationally is eight sixty nine an hour, which is, you know, well, say no more. Um, mm -hmm. only Not a living wage. Only, exactly. Only 13% of jobs provide health benefits compared to 59% of workers as a whole group. Um, and it goes on and on and on. And the kind of things that people, the, the couple of things that are important about the, the, the report, um, as they say, it helps dispel the myth of fast food workers as largely untrained teenagers which is the argument you hear that, oh, they're just, it's extra spending money, pocket money for high school kids. In some mm -hmm. cases, yes, but um, uh, they point out that more than two-thirds of core, frontline, fast food workers across the country are over the age of 20, and 68% are the main wage earners for their families. Mm -hmm. So this is not exactly replicated in the, in the um, retail industry in Walmart, but Walmart is notorious for um, mm -hmm. keeping their workers w uh, hours low so they don't have to pay, keep them part time so they don't have to pay full benefits, et cetera, et cetera. So on Black Friday this year, uh, at least 111 people were arrested around the country, including 26 in St. Paul. Mm -hmm. um, Which is, St. Paul had more arrested than any other city. Yeah, yeah. Uh, organizers say actions took place in 1,500 Walmart locations across the country, mm -hmm. up from about 400 last year. Uh, including many people who are, weren't Walmart employees who were acting in solidarity with Walmart workers. Um, another story related to that is last week, voters in the Seattle suburb of SeaTac, 
which I think is Seattle Tacoma, right? Um, gave final approval to a measure to impose a $15 minimum wage at Seattle's International Airport. Um, so yeah. this this idea of of living wage, um, not just not only increasing the minimum wage, but really fighting for for a living wage, um, is gaining steam on all kinds of in the fast food industry and in the retail industry. And as we see the the economy sort of hollow out and be much more dependent on retail, I think this uh, story is going to only get bigger. It wasn't covered very much. Uh, we're too busy covering the uh, the mania. Of, uh, yes. of, of what used to be called Black Friday, I guess it's, is it called Black Thursday and Friday now? Because a lot of the stores open on yeah. pretty early in the day at 6 o'clock or maybe earlier on Thanksgiving. So mm -hmm. uh, that's another issue which we won't go into. Wrong, wrong. Another headline I thought was the Supreme Court announced some of the cases they will be hearing in the next year and, and the, the rulings on the major cases usually don't come out until June, but they, take, they set their docket in the fall. The one that interested me particularly was two cases that were announced um, Oh, a couple weeks ago. I, I'm not very good at dates here. Um, but two, uh, I'm getting some Bloomberg news. They have a, something called a SCOTUS blog. SCOTUS is Supreme Court of the United States. Um, taking on a new constitutional dispute over the Affordable Care Act, the Supreme Court on Tuesday agreed to hear religious challenges to the requirement that employers provide health insurance for their workers that includes birth control and related medical services. The court said it would decide constitutional issues as well as claims under the Religious Freedom Restoration Act of 1993. The two cases, one of them is called Sibelius uh, versus Hobby Lobby Stores, and another one is Conestoga Wood Specialties Corp versus Sibelius. Sibelius is uh, Kathleen Sibelius, the Health and Human Services Secretary. Mm. Isn't that right? Um, Taking the Conestoga, well, the, basically the, the Hobby Lobby is the owners are, are Christians and they run their business as a Christian operation. So they're saying that they should not be forced to provide health care as they are under the Affordable Care Act to, that includes contraception. And uh, so the, and the Conestoga case is kind of related. Uh, it's, a, it's a different business that is objecting to having to provide health plans that include abortion because they're also for religious reasons. Now this is the religion of the owner. What the Supreme Court is, well I'll just read what mm -hmm. uh, the SCOTUS blog says. The court in confronting the issue probably will have to decide whether the business itself is a person mm -hmm. under the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. Mm -hmm. If it decides that Congress did not mean to include a corporation as a person, that could be the end of the corporation's claim. Um, so what, it, what we're talking about is the Supreme Court being asked to extend the infamous ruling in Citizens United versus Holder, where, or versus whoever it was, the, sp the Supreme Court case where uh, corporations were ruled to have First Amendment rights, a freedom of speech, which is applies to their corporate spending on campaigns, mm -hmm. which as we know, that, that was ruled by the yes. Supreme Court that they do have that right, and the money That's is really already just us. flowing. It's hurt us enormously. Yeah. Now, there, we're being, you know, can a, can a corporation have religious beliefs Yes, and exactly. have you know religious freedom it's getting and, and this idea of the of the personification uh, of, of corporations proceeds apace it was it got a little bit of coverage but I thought it was pretty mm -hmm. undercovered speaking of undercovered <laughs> um, there were two reports that came out um, actually on the same day on October 22nd um, Amnesty International released a report will I be next US drone strikes in Pakistan a 76 page report um, on, on drone strikes in Pakistan and on the same day and they, in fact they had a joint press conference Human Rights Watch released a 106 page report uh, on uh, drone strikes in Yemen. Um, were very noteworthy um, it, they both got a little bit of coverage but they can't kind of blipped up and blip back down um, Will I Be Next the Pakistan report from Amnesty uh, finds that the drone killings that the United States has conducted in Pakistan and um, violated the right to life and may constitute extrajudicial executions or war crimes. The U.S. appears to be exploiting the lawless and remote nature of the local region to evade accountability for violations of the right to life. Survivors of drone strikes and families of the victims have little or no chance of securing justice. U.S. authorities have failed to acknowledge responsibility for specific strikes, let alone establish a mechanism for investigating potentially unlawful killings and providing redress where appropriate. And then they list some recommendations that Obama should disclose the facts and legal basis for the killings. The uh, Intelligence and Armed Services Committees of Congress should promptly launch investigations and on and on. Human Rights Watch um, 
focused on Yemen, and they really went in depth on about, I think, nine uh, sp attacks and really in researched them. Two of the attacks, they say, killed civilians indiscriminately in clear violation of the laws of war, and the others may have targeted people who are not legitimate military objectives or caused disproportionate civilian deaths. And they also had recommendations similar to the Obama administration, explain the full legal basis on which the U.S. carries out targeted killings, um, et cetera, et cetera, and to the governments of the United States and Yemen, ensure that all targeted killings conducted during armed conflict situations accord with the laws of war, implement a system of prompt and meaningful compensation for civilian loss, conduct prompt, thorough, and impartial investigations into the cases in this report and other cases. So these um, are not just um, data-filled reports, but include uh, statements and, and recommendations for policymakers. So had I been reporting on it for CBS, for example, you mm -hmm. know, you, I think you'd want to go Too bad put, you're put those, not. <laughs> yeah, I know, put those people on the spot and have a microphone on the face of some of these people who could implement some of these things, the chairs of the committees, the, the administration spokesmen, say, well, well, how about it? We didn't get much of that. Um, mm -hmm. So it's up to activists to continue their good work to get this in the, mm -hmm. onto the front page. I was going to say back on the front page. Yes. I don't know, hasn't been there yet. One good thing is there may be, have been, and I don't know, but there may have been a significant worldwide coverage. Mm -hmm. This is one of those kinds of things that sort of is a blip in oh. the United States, but around the world can kind of draw attention to an issue and create mm -hmm. a dialogue and sort of a place to start. In fact, that's one of the things we've talked about on the air here. Uh, that's an excellent point because the, the, the failure to report in this country of, of behaviors on our government's part or our allies' part mm -hmm. um, of things like this keeps Americans ignorant of just what you're talking about. The outrage, the, the, the shared sense of, of what it means to have a nation that's so powerful uh, running roughshod over some of these things. Then when the, when the um, response comes in, whether it's in the United Nations or in terrorist attacks or whatever it is, not totally explainable, but it connected to that resentment and that, that sense of uh, being violated, it comes as such a shock to people in the U.S. just for what you were saying, Nancy. Mm -hmm. We never heard of this. What, what mm -hmm. are they upset about? We don't know about it. Just one related thing that I just heard about today is the U.N.'s um, statement of a year of solidarity, I think, with the Palestinian people mm -hmm. or something like that. Mm -hmm. And that is seems like a pretty significant yeah. step for them to take and one that is probably going to be kept pretty quiet in this right. country, I exactly. would imagine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it's a big, important step Very worldwide, important. I think. Yeah. And um, we'll get back to, I have a little thing to talk about later that kind of references the, the, uh, the claims of ignorance that we use to sort of shield mm -hmm. ourselves from mm -hmm. um, various things. Um, an underreported story that really just was a one-day story, and I don't usually comment on, uh, on opinion pieces, but this was an opinion piece in Xinhua, the official Chinese news service, um, on October 12th, uh, headlined, U.S. fiscal failure warrants a de-Americanized world. Um, and of course, October 12th, if you remember, was when we were in the thick of our budget crisis and talking about a shutdown, and or there was a shutdown, talking oh, about uh, the um, uh, defaulting on the debt, which happened, uh, the mm -hmm. deadline was the 17th. This was October 12th This came out. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to read a couple of uh, quotes, and this is a great example of what you were saying, Nancy, because this this particular piece and the broader sentiment behind it has been widely talked about around the world. I doubt very few of our viewers probably have heard of it. Right. The author succinctly summarized uh, some of these things that I think a lot of the world has been thinking. Quote, instead of honoring its duties as a responsible leading power, a self-serving Washington has abused its superpower status and introduced even more chaos into the world by shifting financial risks overseas, instigating regional tensions amid territorial disputes very timely right now, mm. and fighting unwarranted wars under the cover of outright lies. Didn't mention Iraq specifically. As a result, quote, the world is still crawling its way out of an economic disaster thanks to the voracious Wall Street elites. While bombing and killings have become virtually daily routines in Iraq, years after Washington claimed it has liberated its people from tyrannical rule. Iraq was just past the 6,000 mm. mark and people killed this year in political violence. Um, in Afghanistan. Uh, uh, numbers aren't even known. You know? Yes, it's, but the, it's chaotic. the drones are heavy there. Yeah. And um, so he goes on to suggest a number of steps toward a, what he calls a de-Americanized world, saying that what m may also have to be included as a key part of an effective reform is the introduction of new, a new international reserve currency 
that is to be created to replace the dominant U.S. dollar so that the international community could permanently stay away from the spillover of the intensifying domestic political turmoil in the United States. I actually think this, is, this story of the declining power of the United States, the decline of the American empire, maybe it's, it's my, one of my top three stories of, of overall, I mean year after year after year. And mm -hmm. this, this is just a, an expression of some of the, uh, the, the talk that used to be unthinkable. Now it's not only unthinkable, but this is the response this particular piece got around the world, again, like Nancy said, other than in the United States, mm -hmm. was immense. Uh, people are talking about it all over the place. Um, and as Emmanuel Wallerstein, a great uh, commentator on the world system, in a piece called Consequences of U.S. Decline, um, talks about uh, the f two real consequences of the decline of American power, he says we can be fairly sure of in the decade to come. The first is the end of the U.S. dollar as the currency of last resort. When this happens, the United States will have lost a major protection for its national budget and for the cost of its economic operations. And the second is the decline, probably a serious decline, in the relative standard of living of U.S. citizens and residents. The political consequences of this latter development are hard to predict in detail, but will not be insubstantial, which no. is putting it mildly, I think. We haven't declined in our military power, though. Well, that's kind of our ace and hole, you know. Um, but it may not be. I mean, we may not be able to be kind of the bully on the block yeah. anymore. Um, it's already it's already showing up. To me, I think the Snowden revelations w was a game changer. You mm -hmm. know, in terms mm -hmm. of it emboldened so many other countries to be able to say what everybody's been thinking for a long right. time, and and then followed by Syria. It's just in the last few months, there's it seems like there's been a rapid de-Americanization yeah. that enables. China to say things like this. Yeah. Everything's changing about about power, I think, mm -hmm. and, and, it, and other nations' relationships to the United States. And there's States. some news about China in the news right now. I want to come back to it, mm -hmm. talk about it a little bit more in depth. But the last two headlines I have um, have to do with climate, which is w one of my other stories that I think is the uber issue of the uh, age. In fact, it should be on the front page every day in my mind. Right. Um, two, two reports that came out in October, no, one in October and one in November. On October 15th, uh, a study was published in a, um, a biology journal that got quite a bit of coverage um, uh, talking about the oceans, hu uh, how, how climate change is affecting the oceans. And, uh, well, th one of the authors of the report said, we are truly making a big mess out of the ocean with this climate change. The human ramifications of these changes are likely to be massive and disruptive. Food chains, fishing, and tourism could all be impacted. Mm -hmm. The study shows that some 470 to 870 million of the world's poorest people rely on the ocean for food, jobs, and revenues, and live in countries where ocean goods and services could be compromised by multiple ocean biogeochemical changes. Um, the state's news service, which most people don't have access to, but I do through my database, uh, reported that even seemingly positive changes at high alt latitudes, um, where some people talk about as it warms up, we'll be able to grow more food and this and that, they say even seemingly positive changes at high latitudes are not necessarily beneficial. Invasive species have been immigrating to these areas due to changing ocean conditions mm -hmm. and will threaten the local species and the humans who depend on them, one of the authors said. Also, not related to the oceans, but just in the last day or two was a report about cutting enormous numbers of pine trees in New Jersey. I don't know if you heard this. Because mm -hmm. the, of climate change, the winters are getting mild enough mm -hmm. that the pine beetle coming up from the Carolinas is now, mm -hmm. which used to be killed off during the winter mm -hmm. in New Jersey, is now thriving in New Jersey, and they're losing an enormous amount of the New Jersey pine forest. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's already here. Um, that's mm -hmm. one report. I could go on about that. The second one came out on November 2nd, and the New York Times actually had it on page one, about the only paper that did, had it covered at all, but the headline they had was, Climate Change Seen Posing Risk to Food Supplies. And um, it was a leaked report of an upcoming IPCC, the Interplanet, no, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, IPCC, mm -hmm. um, which is going to release the report in the spring. This was leaked early, and um, I'll just give a couple of highlights. Uh, climate change will pose sharp risks to the world's food supply in coming decades potentially undermining crop production and driving up prices at a time when the demand for food is expected to soar, scientists have found. The group Think Progress reported that the draft report, which is set to be released in March but was leaked online, 
also confirmed previous studies' findings that climate change could exacerbate poverty, strain water supplies, make extreme weather more common, and increase conflict around the world. Cities are most vulnerable to climate change's effects, according to the report, along with the world's most impoverished communities. And three of the specific predictions they make is one I mentioned about food. Water, they say, for every degree increase in temperature, an additional 7% of the world's population will see a decline in water resources of 20%, the report predicts. Climate change is also expected to worsen water quality in some places due to sediment and pollution inflows from increasingly heavy rainstorms, which we've already seen some of that. Mm -hmm. um, threats to cities, I mentioned. Threats to health. Climate change will exacerbate already existing health problems throughout the 21st century, and humans will more likely be more likely to die from wildfires, heat waves, lack of food in impoverished areas, and disease vectors like mosquitoes, which are already expanding their ranges. Another version of the warming that's changing the ecosystem on the on the level of animals yes. and insects. Meanwhile, we had another annual global climate summit. Yes, and very poorly reported. Right, right? in Warsaw. Yeah, in Warsaw. Poland. The and um, well, it got little coverage, but the the corporate influence was stronger than ever. Mm -hmm. Yeah, to the extent that it, some of the countries just had to walk out yep. because they wouldn't even, you know, they were sabotaged. Right, and so the headlines strong. in this country mostly had to do with the poor countries asking rich countries to pay so much money that it was a it was a dead on arrival, a non-starter, yes. that kind of thing. Uh, so again, I it's know. another example of, of a, these kind of comments and the walkout and all this stuff. Major headlines around the world. Yes. Minor headlines, if at mm -hmm. all, in this country. But it's 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 like I said, it's one of my top three stories of the decade, if not the century. So uh, I don't know if we have this clip, but I do want to talk about. Oh. Uh, we could maybe watch a three-minute clip do the if we clip have it. Now? Um, <laughs> a, which is another unreported story about the effects which have dropped out of the news since the budget debates yeah. about the sequestration mm -hmm. which is the uh, automatic budget cuts that uh, threaten to kick in at any minute. Do we have that clip? Washington isn't too popular these days. Politicians have taken the country through an endless series of self-inflicted budget crises instead of finding solutions to get our fiscal house in order. Congress chopped 1.5 trillion from the budget that is gone forever. After that first cut, Congress still couldn't agree on a balanced solution to the deficit. Instead, it enacted harmful across-the-board cuts that will cut spending by $109 billion in 2014, with a total of $1 trillion by 2021. So where do these cuts come from, and how will they impact you? First, let's look at the federal budget. There are two parts, mandatory spending and discretionary spending. Mandatory spending makes up around two-thirds of the budget. This funding comes from the rules that Congress puts into law. Discretionary spending makes up only one-third of the budget. This is funding that Congress must approve every year. Discretionary spending funds a wide variety of activities. Defense programs use over half of this money. The rest supports all sorts of core public services that people use every day. Services that are the grease in our country's wheels. Things like public health and safety, education, job training, and protecting the environment. After doing the math, it turns out that these programs make up only 15% of the whole federal budget, even though they do so much. And these non-defense programs have been cut the most, about 900 billion in the past three years. So why are they taking the brunt of the cuts? Because we take these programs for granted. We assume our food will be safe to eat, our water clean to drink, that the police will come when we need help, and when we get sick, that our medicine will be available. We forget about how federal investments support our everyday lives. Cuts to these programs will impact all of us. Fewer food inspectors mean your food is less safe to eat. Cuts to first responders means they may not get to you in your time of need. Your life-saving medication may not be refilled if funding for prescription drugs is axed. Your child's education is at risk with fewer teachers, bigger classes, and outdated textbooks. Lost your job? Looking for a new one? You'll have less help since federal job training funds have been slashed. If these programs are cut, we will be less healthy, less safe, less educated, and less job ready. We will all be affected. But Congress isn't done yet. 
Some in Congress are doubling down to pass even more cuts, and some of these programs may completely disappear. Enough is enough. We cannot cut more services vital to the health and well-being of our families and communities. Congress must find a balanced approach to deficit reduction. Find out more about the impact of these cuts and what you can do to protect these programs. Well, I think that uh, the reason balanced I, approach. The reason I, uh, I, I, the reason I wanted to show that clip was not that I agree with their analysis. I don't actually. I, I don't think the reason that we, the discretionary programs are facing the bulk of the cuts is because we take them for granted. Mm -hmm. I think it's a more result of. Um, the power dynamics in the larger culture. But the reason I think that that, that was a good clip is I think it's pretty concise and gives a, a, a real easy to understand uh, glimpse at the extent of the cuts and the, and the, and the breadth that it's yeah. across the board with, with, a, with programs that are really a relatively small part of the overall budget. Mm -hmm. But so the idea that, that um, um, they're going to have some big effect on the deficit is called into question in, right there. Another place I don't agree with the people who did that is that um, the mania about the deficit is, is we should be attacking the idea of deficit reduction as the biggest problem, not mm -hmm. just this is the bad way to go about it. Mm -hmm. but, but the point is that the, the, um, if you can remember, it doesn't seem, it seems like a long time ago, but it was, it was uh, just, just a little over a month ago that we were talking about nothing but the budget yeah, and the yeah. cuts and all that stuff. And since the, the deal, which is going to circle around pretty quick again, be in the news, what we haven't been hearing is the actual cuts, that, like they said, have already happened. Mm -hmm. you know, and, people, so, and I think that's, that's partly a result of the people who set the agenda in the, in the mass media mm -hmm. on a national level aren't personally affected by this. Mm -hmm. They're not the ones losing their unemployment benefits, which, by the way, is coming up right now, just on the news today, yes. um, but also they're not the ones with the food stamp cuts in exactly. a separate process, and uh, they're not the ones who are looking for job training programs, you know, they're, mm -hmm. not, they're not losing their jobs to outsourcing, so they don't have to be retrained to learn a new mm -hmm. skill. So these, these um, when the, the clip says the problem is we take them for granted, I think part of it is people, A, aren't aware of the extent of them, but on a personal level, the burdens that people feel, I think, by ignorance of the larger picture, people think it's it's them. It's just me or the people I know. They don't I get know. that they're part of a, a group of people that is being targeted here. Mm -hmm. So they, they makes it that much more difficult to organize, which is an ancillary benefit for the people making cuts, I think. Mm -hmm. They're not taking the heat. And so it just drops out of newspapers. You really, I haven't seen, other than food stamps, which has been a, a part of the farm bill, which is mm -hmm. in the news, uh, I really haven't seen hardly anything in the, the media I look at about the effects of the sequester cuts, mm -hmm. which are, are pretty extreme, and they just go on. You know, they're not well, and what's scary, I think, is it shows something that I think is really important, is going to be really important going forward, which is that we can get acclimatized to these cuts, yes, yes. these kind of cuts, yes. and, and, there's, and there are people who really want to hollow out public services and the, and the government altogether. And it's the middle class and, and the poor right. that are really suffering the effects, but all of a sudden the sun keeps coming, you know, right. rising and setting, and uh, to some people the world doesn't look that different. Now all the things that they talked about are things you can buy your way out of. Right. If you have a lot of money, you, right. can, you can pay for private schools, you can even increasingly pay for your own uh, first responder right. services. Right. So, I just see us going in a direction mm -hmm. where there are, where people of means are able to basically compensate mm -hmm. for these cuts, and then everybody else really is just going to have to suffer with them, and it's going to be hard to get them back. Yeah. You know, there was a lot of people that worked really hard to prevent those cuts from happening, mm -hmm. but now that they've happened, I just think another round of cuts are coming. I don't know when they're going to stop. Right, and I yes. think that the part of the answer to this is, I mean, structurally in the media, as we see the we keep using the term hollowing out, but as the media is hollowed out and there's fewer and fewer uh, resources available in the existing corporate media system to pay for journalism, that we're more and more dependent on the, the, um, the elite journalists in the Washington, New York, Los Angeles to some extent, and London uh, to set the agenda. And again, these are people who are themselves fairly insulated from these, these real world mm -hmm. effects. Not that they're all related to government directly, but sometimes when the market is going berserk, which it has, seems to be doing increasingly often, uh, one of the places people can find some, some 
relief is from public funds. And that's, we're told, you know, what's being normalized is that there aren't any public funds. We can't afford it. There's not enough resources. Well, that, the voices questioning that are just absent from the media, pretty much. Yes. And it, it goes along with this whole philosophy, and it started with Reagan, et cetera, et cetera, of the trickle down. Yep. It's all part of that, and it's And the idea of class sure. warfare. Yes. Yep. That you can't talk about these without about starting war. <laughs> um, yeah. so. Unless we start winning. We'll talk but about. anyway, that's right. being proven well, right. more and Some more. Some people are saying and they that, started the war it, against right, right, right. a lot the of the media. Well, right. not you know the underground media is certainly mm -hmm. disputing the fact that you know, well, and that, even the Pope came out and said, "Yeah, in fact, I like capitalism about that. I, I and this kind of capitalism is causing." Well, yeah, that was interesting. I haven't had a yeah. chance to read the whole speech, yeah. but I the, yeah. it's filtered through the media a little bit and. Uh, yeah, interesting stuff. It's hard to get around his message when they yeah. report no. it. You know, it's <laughs> real interesting to have the Pope on our side. Yeah, right. Well, so, let's see if that makes a. Well, he's from influence. Argentina, so you know, it's a quite a change from. But the, this philosophy of cutting um, is, you know, it's it's not good. Well, one of the things I'd like to talk about, and this is allow me a little soapbox here, but um, I talk a lot about the the media playing a function of propaganda, and the. By, by that, I don't mean propaganda as most people mean it, like uh, a, just a specific attempt to convince you of something. It's a, it's a, it's a process of, of being part of an intellectual culture that elevates certain ideas mm -hmm. to prominence and, and suppresses or represses other ones. But also, it's not just ideas, but it's ways of thinking. And I want to, the New York Times gave a great example just a couple weeks ago on November 23rd. Um, it just so happened on the same day there were two stories that I think are very connected. They didn't appear to be connected, but I'll talk about them a little bit. On the front page was an article about drones headlined, Questions on Drone Strike Find Only Silence. And it talked about a man from Yemen named Jaber who came to Washington, and, quote, to tell his story, how he watched in horror last year as drone-fired missiles incinerated his nephew and brother-in-law in a remote Yemeni village. Neither were guilty of anything, and this guy had traveled to Washington to uh, for quote acknowledgement and an apology, as the Times put it. He did not have much luck. Um, but what's interesting about the story is they're, they're, so they're talking about the response to this guy's trip, and they're at five different times. Well, here I'll just read. Quote: No one has been able to explain why his relatives were killed or why the administration is not willing to acknowledge its mistake. Two, it was an error of unusual resonance. Three, the strike in August 2012 drew widespread indignation in Yemen and was documented in the New York Times and later by human rights groups, along with a number of other strikes that accidentally killed innocent people. Four, a Yemeni counterterrorism official called Mr. Jaber hours after the strike to apologize for the mistake. Mm. Five, President Obama promised greater transparency, but the administration still refuses to discuss specific strikes or to apologize or pay compensation for strikes that went wrong. Bear that in mind as we look at the other story, which is on the front page of the business section. Hmm. That headline was, U.S. retailers decline to aid factory victims in Bangladesh. One year after the Tazreen factory fire in Bangladesh, many retailers that sold garments produced there or inside the Rana Plaza building that collapsed last spring are refusing to join an effort to compensate the families of the more than 1,200 workers who died in those disasters. Oh, that was horrible. First interesting thing to notice is that the reporter used the word refused. Mm -hmm. The headline says they declined. Mm -hmm. It was much more polite. <laughs> A handful of retailers, they say, based in Europe, quote, are, getting, are deeply involved in getting long-term compensation funds off the ground. But in contrast, quote, so far none of the U.S. retailers have agreed to pay a single penny for compensation. And they specifically mention Walmart, Sears, and a U.S.-based clothing retailer called The Children's Place. Walmart says the clothes were being made in the factory by unauthorized contractors working, quote, without the company's knowledge. And Walmart has a vice president for ethical sourcing who told the Times that, quote, there was no production for Walmart in Rana Plaza at the time of this tragedy, repeating that the Walmart-related production at Tarzine was unauthorized. Hmm. Um, Sears, likewise, quote, said an unauthorized contractor had been producing on its behalf at Tazreen. 
and U.S.-based clothing retailer The Children's Place said that fact that factory was not supplying it when the building collapsed. Um, so what's the connection? What we ha usually see in this country, and it's reflected in the media, is a way of thinking that I call analytical or scientific thinking, where it's, it's uh, well, and I contrast it with systems thinking. Um, so, system, I'll just, ex just briefly talk about systems thinking versus analytical thinking. System says to look for patterns and operations that tend to produce certain outcomes in, a, in, in contrast with analytical thinking, which says look for the guilty party. Mm -hmm. um, so you ask who did it instead of what was going on. Uh, analytical thinking tells us to look for a cause of the things we see. What made that building collapse? Systems thinking says there's no cause, just outcomes. So instead of saying who's at fault, you say why did this happen? Not why for the specific cause, but what were the processes in place that resulted in a collapse or a fire or a locked uh, fire escape door, those kind of things. Analytical thinking has us look for someone to blame, which encourages us to look at intentions, to look into someone's heart. Systems thinking, by looking at outcomes rather than guilty parties, skips that step. So instead of stop them and looking for the bad guys, we say, this was inevitable. How can we change the systems to make it have a different outcome? And here's where we get back to Black, Black Friday. Um, the mania of shopping and selling ever more for lower prices. Uh, and the bargains and all this is what leads these retailers to go to Tazreen and go to Rana Plaza and, and clothe themselves in the ignorance because if they, and U.S. law kind of backs them up. It's really a, a, the, the dominant um, mm -hmm. way of thinking is to really individualize it and say, if that person meant to hurt you, they're guilty. If they didn't mean to, then they're not guilty. So if, if we all participate, in a system that results in these things, which it does again and again and again, and it results in all kinds of other things too, stock bubbles and bank collapses and foreclosures. You know, if you keep trying to find the bad person who's trying to throw Nancy out of her house or throw, you know, repossess my car, um, then you, the, inevitably the way of thinking that that I, uh, exemplifies leads you to think that if we just would elect different people, or if we just would appoint different people, or if we could just get those corporations to be nice to us by, be, by having different people in charge, then things would change. Or if Hillary would just run for president. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You get attached to, to specific candidates and thinking that candidates lead movements instead of movements producing candidates. And you get all backwards and upside down. And it's related to the drone story because you notice the defense up and down is it's a mistake, it's an error. In other words, the intention is to protect the American people. The collateral damage or the unfortunate mistake, error, um, mistake that went wrong, these kind of things absolve people of responsibility because they didn't mean to do it. Mm -hmm. Now, when something happens over and over and over again, if, if you're thinking in terms of a systems way, you know, the, all of us are participants. So uh, that's why the protesters are not just out there protesting with, with this occupier, whoever it is, not just saying, um, you need to do things differently. The critique extends to us and we need to do things differently. And we need to organize ourselves to change the, the structures and processes that inevitably lead to Tazreen or Rana Plaza or drone strikes because people get so freaked out and they think it's a result of bad guys attacking us who are, what are we? We're good guys. So, you know, it's a good guy, bad guy, black, white, either, or, up, down, us, them way of thinking. It's not just specific ideas, although there are mm -hmm. ideas too. Mm -hmm. uh, the idea that these are mistakes mm -hmm. is a specific idea we're supposed to believe. Another now, idea with the drones is we're doing this because it's the way to protect the most civilians. Because if we didn't do this, we'd be sending troops in on exactly, the ground exactly. to these places. Exactly. And it's like, we would? I mean, <laughs> right, yeah. Yeah. by whose authority? I yeah, mean, exactly. exactly. It's, it's a whole other set of questions. Right. But you don't think, you think, oh, good. So it's actually, a good, the drone strikes are actually a good thing. Exactly. And it's, it's actually a benevolent thing. Yeah. And that's, and that the individualism that's inherent in, in looking for good guys and bad guys and saying um, things, good things or bad things happen because of heroes or villains, as opposed to, uh, resulting from the way you set things up to, you know, if you, if you design cars and cut costs on, on uh, quality control, then when people careen out of control because their brakes fail, well, is that an accident? There's a, a, a sign that was spotted on a, on a, after the, um, it was a mining disaster in West Virginia a couple of years ago, and I'm trying to remember the name of the town, but there was a sign on the roadside 
um, near there that said that had been put up by the miners, um, accidents don't happen. They're the result of people's decisions. You know, it isn't really an accident. They don't just happen. And that idea that 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 things feed into it, and we have to change the nature of of the things that are being fed into it, but also the uh, the nature of the system itself is um, is an idea that um, the way we're trained to think um, by the media, and, and not just the media, the media just is it's made part up of, of the people system. who, yeah, they just do it like everybody else. I, th I think another important piece on the on the drone strikes is that the media really do they don't have the capacity to question something like this because they think of themselves as reporters, mm -hmm. uh, neutral observers. Yeah. Um, so they're waiting for somebody to ra else to raise the mm -hmm. questions. And I believe it was Alan Grayson who brought the speakers here to talk about the drone strikes. And there wasn't really um, there wasn't really a whole lot going on except for in mm -hmm. the alternative media and the internet. Right. Uh, on the drone strikes, but it really did force the questions uh, in the mainstream media. Mm -hmm. So I think that is a lesson to activists yeah. that you need to do something newsworthy, you need to bring people right. here, you need to set up a way for the media to actually start asking the questions. And then after that, you need to set up some kind of um, action right. that can address the, the issue. Yeah. Because otherwise, we sort of, these things happen and everyone feels. Mm -hmm not responsible right. for it and doesn't really know how to take any action to make it better. One of the people I talk about a lot in, in Nygaard Knows, my newsletter and also on the show, is, is a, a guy named Edward Bernays, who's the father of public relations. Um, wrote a very uh, influential book called Propaganda in 1928. I quoted from a lot, but one of the things he talks about is just what you're saying, Nancy, that, that a, a public relations professional uh, knows that if you, you don't just say something to an unprimed audience, because people, you, you want to get people, as he put it, uh, keyed to a certain pitch of interest mm -hmm. uh, in a subject, so they're already thinking about it. Then when you address that issue, whether you're a politician or a propagandist or whatever, uh, interesting distinction, um, <laughs> uh, then people say, oh, he's t he or she is talking about what I want to know about. I've been thinking about this. So when people are terrified of, of uh, terrorism, then when you give them a, 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 a solution, whether it's drone strikes or war or whatever it is, people say, that's what I was looking for. Mm -hmm. But if you just, so that I think that's what, exactly what I think what you're saying, Nancy, is that we have to pay attention not only to making the facts known in some sort of, you know, like on the show, for example, but also in, in priming the audience and making people uh, sit up and say, why should I care about that? Let's give them an answer, you know. Mm -hmm. And because uh, the media's not going to do it for us, and we have right. to take shows like this and, and support our community radio and public TV and whatever we whatever means we have. Uh, it's interesting. Public too. television isn't I'm, so I'm good. Well, this know. is public television. You can oh, also, I'm about oh no, this is community. Yeah, you can also actually access. Move, right. You can move the media. You can move the story. I think that's another important thing. Mm -hmm. Is activists starting from the grassroots, starting with the ground up, can actually shift the story and shift the way it's covered and shift the way a, a typical journalist Absolutely. would start saying the widely condemned drone strikes of the United States. Or you can right. see shifts in language over time mm -hmm. that are actually really helpful to our cause. So that, again, it's it's worth it to Good try point. to focus on. Mm -hmm on um, raising the issue and then sort of normalizing a new way of talking mm -hmm. about it. And the other thing I think that's really important in the current era where we're facing so many cutbacks in, in resources devoted to journalism, one of the results, and this is where you look at the system and how the system's working, um, one or of the not. results is that, that uh, <laughs> journalists like and kind of need to be sort of spoon-fed a lot of their information. They don't have the time to do the, the, the groundwork to, to really go out and investigate. So what does that mean for us? Well, that means that every activist group in my mind should have someone really, and maybe a committee, paying attention to how you're going to present yourself to the public, including the media, mm -hmm. and have somebody who's really good at it or develop the skills in the, in the organization that you, you, you share these skills. So when the media comes to talk to us at our demonstrations, we don't just kind of get tongue-tied and say, oh, mm -hmm. geez, I'm, I'm on the jumbotron, you know, um, but really have somebody who's prepared, is on message, just the kind of, it's, it's public relations skills, really. Yeah. Um, because like Nancy said, you know, the media's not going to do it for us. We have to get their attention. We have to get the attention of the public. So when we do speak to these issues, people say, you know, I was wondering about that. Mm -hmm. Or, yeah, that bothered me too. What are you going to do about it? Mm -hmm. What if you were in power? You know, oh, we have an answer for that. 
So, uh, and that's sometimes I think we, we think it's so sort of self-evident that sometimes I think uh, we, we skimp on our pre preparation for talking to the media mm -hmm. and, and count on them to come and talk to us, and that doesn't always work that way. You know, I'd be curious what you think, Jeff, about, about how climate, getting back to climate change, such a huge issue, something that's a system that we're all a part of, and yet we all, and none of us really know how to take the action that's required to make a change. And we see all this inaction happening on the international mm -hmm. level, especially in the United States. How should the media cover climate change? Well, see, um, I think we'll, we'll, we'll talk about this a little bit next month because we'll do the end of the year top stories. But, mm -hmm. but the way I've been talking about it on this show and elsewhere is um, I w would like to see... Um, this is actually... a big question, we should talk about this m more, but uh, um, it gets back to who decides what's newsworthy. And the, the, the standard conception is, you know, uh, it's what's unusual, it's what catches your eye, and that's because the media is set up not to provide news, the corporate media, but it's to provide viewers to advertisers. Mm -hmm. So you put on whatever, well, today, for example, December 2nd, as we're doing this show, um, today's news was a, a big train wreck in the Bronx. Very photogenic. You see the big backed-off picture and the trains lying there next to the, you know, the East River or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. and, um, and there's a lot of media in New York City, so oh, they can just go Oh, it's all over the, the place. Yeah, that. just go down the street. Yeah. And so, so that gets on the front page of the big picture. Not that it isn't newsworthy, mm -hmm. but we have to work on things that, uh, that uh, aren't so newsworthy. Climate change tends to be reported incident to incident. Yeah. This flood, that drought. Um, so I think what I would do is... is, is figure out a way that we can hold our media accountable for saying, you know, this is um, what used to be called a beat. And we'd have a climate beat. And when you have a, a beat, we used to have a, the city hall beat or the crime beat or the national security beat. They still have that, um, those things. But if you had a climate beat, what you're saying is that this is something like public safety. Everybody cares about it. It's newsworthy whether something happens or doesn't. In fact, if nothing happens, and mm -hmm. it's the municipal, state, or federal levels, that's news mm -hmm. because this is a major problem. Mm -hmm. If they're not doing anything, that's a front page story. Mm -hmm. Right now, the front page stories tend to be the ones that are most photogenic, the most you know, uh, dramatic. Uh, so when a typhoon hits, the biggest typhoon in recorded history, hits the Philippines, mm -hmm. it gets news for a week or two. But when the severity, the, the trend of more severe mm -hmm. typhoons, uh, which you have to pay attention over time. You have to put things two and two together. You have to get talk to different sources who aren't on. It, it, uh, well, I'm going on and on about it, but basically it gets back to who decides what's newsworthy and what does the media condition us to consider front page material. And right now, climate generally, except for events, individual mm -hmm. events, mm -hmm. is not newsworthy. It's not judged to be front page news. Mm -hmm. Where I think sitting here, the three of us would say, this is the big, one of the big this stories of the day. This is the big day. story. Right. Yeah. And if there so, was an asteroid coming toward the Earth that was about to obliterate life on Earth. <laughs> <laughs> That's a big one too. That would be a big one. Right? That would be a big one. But, but if, it, if it happens a little slower, exactly. yeah. it's, it's not only not on the front page, it's actually yeah. not in the media at all. Yeah. That seems like you know, a problem to, to solve. What you know? I find too is when these disasters do happen and they make the news, mm -hmm. when the mainstream media including public television, which just um, will have a disclaimer afterwards and say, we cannot say this is the result of climate change. Right. Mm -hmm. and I mean, they right. specifically say that yeah. so that it misleads people. Mm -hmm. I and mean, I realize you confused. can't exactly say this exact right. whatever, mm -hmm. but it is right. in a pattern of yeah. things. And Well, and see, that's, that's, this is a great illustration, Suzanne, of... of of, a, of how a systems orientation uh, would change that equation entirely because it's sort of like public health. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't say, we can say how many women are going to have breast cancer this year, are going to be diagnosed with breast cancer, roughly. Um, what we can't say is which ones. Now, that doesn't mean that we don't know anything about breast cancer. That doesn't mean, or let's take lung cancer, even better. Mm -hmm. We certainly know there's correlation with various factors, mm -hmm. smoking, particulate pollution, things like that. We don't know who is going to get lung cancer, but that doesn't mean we don't know that there's a correlation between these behaviors and social processes and lung cancer. Mm -hmm. Just like we don't know specifically this particular hurricane, this particular drought, this mm -hmm. particular flood, but when we look at trends over time, we, look at the we can see. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so that issue of did this particular thing, mm -hmm. was that caused by climate change? In a systems analysis, 
that isn't really relevant because you're looking at the big picture and the trends. Mm -hmm. So, you know, sure there's normal variation, um, but we've had, you know, mm -hmm. the 100-year the floods are now two-year floods. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That is, things that used to happen about once every 100 years mm -hmm. happen every couple years now. You the know? problem is that for the newsworthy test, what you're talking about, the single event, the single episode is newsworthy, the patterns and trends are not. Right. So the yes. main message you're getting is not necessarily caused by climate change right. and you're not getting the larger story because yes. it doesn't meet the newsworthy criteria. In fact, just harken back to our, the little clip we saw half an hour ago, uh, it starts out with some graphs and charts. It's not very photogenic, it's not very jazzy, mm -hmm. you know. I'm really interested in the subject and that we wa I want to make a point yeah. that this isn't very well uh, covered, but, you know, it's not like, um, a human interest story about, you know, somebody losing their food stamps, you know. The, the bigger picture, the macro picture, it's still incumbent upon us, as Nancy yeah. implied or said, that we have to make this stuff newsworthy. We yeah. have to make it interesting and jazzy, uh, and, and it is. And I think the one job of the media is to connect the dots for us on how the decisions that we make affect these issues. Absolutely. You know, how they, what, what happens down the line for everything that we do, mm -hmm. including our activism or lack of activism or, activi or advocacy of certain candidates or other candidates, um, because that's the piece that is still, even if it's all in the news, yeah. I have a friend who said every time the meteorologist talks about storms, he mentions climate change. And I said, oh, good. And she said, oh, actually, I was thinking, wow, that's kind of depressing. I've heard a lot about climate change. It <laughs> <laughs> um, is kind of depressing. You know, <laughs> well, it is depressing. <laughs> But that's, this I situation. think there, is a, uh, there right. is a sort of a disconnect, even mm -hmm. if you hear about the systems, to really understanding yeah. your role in the systems and, and your capacity to change mm -hmm. the systems or address it. Yeah. It seems like uh, something the media so. could. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Exactly. It's a big, big change. Well, you know, we're not going to, we're getting close to the end of the show, and I've got two more things. Okay. One, is, one is too long, so I'll go with the shorter <laughs> one. But this is right in the news just right now. Mm -hmm. um, there's been uh, news about China declaring oh, yes, uh, a certain couple, a few little islands are contested between J jurisdiction between Japan and China, and they're called the Senkaku uh, Islands in Japan and the Daioyu in China. Um, I just want to talk about a couple of things, because I've actually been talking about this story for a few years in Nygaard Notes. Good. It, it, this story meaning, I'll show you in a second. On November 23rd, the uh, People's Republic of China set up the East China Sea Air Defense Identification Zone, which includes the, the Senkaku Islands. This is, this is from um, uh, the c corporate media. They refer to the S Senkaku Islands, which is the Japanese term. So mm -hmm. right away they're saying which side they're on. Mm -hmm. And announced that it would require all aircraft entering the zone to file a flight plan and submit radio frequency or transponder information. Um, just today, as we do the show, December 2nd, the New York Times reported on page three, the headline was, in the East China Sea, a far bigger test of power looms. And they quoted one of Obama's current advisors speaking anonymously, saying, it's pretty clear this isn't really about the islands. And the advisor added, quote, they say it's in response to our efforts to contain them, China, that is, but our analysis is that it's really their effort to push our presence further out into the Pacific. Oh. Um, Excuse me. <laughs> our, <laughs> I know what you mean. Uh, our presence, remember that. On November 26th, USA Today, headline on page 6, was Pentagon builds forces in Pacific. Idea is to withstand Chinese missile attack. Now, Chinese missile attack, that sounds kind of bad. But here's the lead paragraph. The Pentagon is fortifying bases in the Pacific and looking mm -hmm. to revive World War II era air bases as part of an effort to survive a Chinese missile attack that could wipe out critical installations on Okinawa and elsewhere. Military records, interviews, and congressional testimony show. Paragraph 3. Chinese ballistic missiles put virtually every U.S. base in the Pacific under, quote, heavy threat, said Michael Lostumbo, director of the RAND Center for Asia-Pacific Study. A RAND report found 90% of its bases were within 1,080 nautical miles of China. So here we have a situation where the United States is encircling China with 90% mm -hmm. of its bases within 1,000 miles, and when China threatens to attack our capacity to attack them, that's called a threat. Yes. Um, and I, what, the reason well, I say when we're talking about this story since 2009 is that back in 2009, I wrote an article called The Iranian Threat, Thinking Strategically. On September 28th of 2009, 
Iran announced that it had test-fired some missiles, saying that, quote, Iranian missiles are able to target any place that threatens Iran, quote-unquote. The Associated Press report on this event bore the headline, Iran tests advanced missiles, raising more concern. Concern about them defending themselves. Mm -hmm. So that's, self-defense is a threat. And in, in 2012, in January, I wrote a piece called War is Peace, Self-Defense is a Threat. And that was in response to a January 9th New York Times headline, U.S. focuses on growing threat as rivals deploy cheap but potent weapons. And they said that President Obama's new military strategy has focused fresh attention on an increasingly important threat, the use of inexpensive weapons like mines and cyber attacks that aim not to defeat the American military in battle, but to keep it at a distance. Yeah. So any attempt to, to respond to to milita U.S. military bases on its borders mm -hmm. or to respond to an attack on itself mm -hmm. is considered, or, or even to shoot at our weapons, mm -hmm. is considered a threat. So that's really a result of what I call the imperial mindset. That this idea, the story right now I'll be watching is, is, is China being aggressive or is China being defensive? Well, I don't know what China's doing, but the coverage assumes uh, that China wants to do something dastardly because like Nancy said, mm -hmm. it's usually an either or, and the alternative would be that we might be doing something dastardly. Mm. Well, that's Heaven unthinkable. Forbid. Therefore, China is opposed to us, and they're the, the other. So I think this this way of thinking of dividing things into either or is another sort of a mm -hmm. thought pattern that's really reinforced in reporting. So somebody's either, with, as George Bush famously said, with us or against us. Mm -hmm. When in fact, another co corollary of what Nancy said earlier is that most of the world has a lot of concerns besides the United States. You know, China's probably a lot more <laughs> concerned about South Korea, uh, which of course is an ally of the United States, but, uh, you know, because they're, they're the next door neighbor. Like, we're more concerned about Mexico. We're more concerned about Cuba, you know, because they're right here. China doesn't have any bases even in the Western Hemisphere, let alone a thousand miles from the United States. Mm -hmm. So, uh, as we follow these stories, it's good to remember how does it look to people who aren't in the Imperial headquarters. So, cool. Oh. We're out of time already, I guess. I know. Well, next Just month. time flies on this show. Well, Nancy, thank you for coming yes. on. And thank Nancy you for will be me. taking over for me following in January, which will be getting will be getting our tenth year Whoa. of wow. our world today. Great Ten years. Yeah, it's show imagine. So J Jeff, you did a fine filling in for both of <laughs> Being Dave both and, and Dave. Jeff. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, you and Dave.